Yesterday's raids by anti-terrorist police on military-style training camps in rural New Zealand have provoked a storm of concern from different groups, some supporting the police action and some supporting those who are now in court. But is there really anything to worry about and is the obvious unhappiness of some people such a surprise? Dylan Quinnell talks to AUT's Professor Paul Moon, an expert on Māori history, about the background to yesterday's raids and how he sees the current situation. Now, Paul, we're here to try and get some understanding of what the actions of this group are based on. So first of all, I'd just like to ask you, does this idea of an armed resistance have a history within New Zealand, for example, dating back to the land wars? It certainly does, and it's not just as far back as the land wars. In fact, as recently as 1916 in the Uwiras, there was armed resistance. Two people were killed in a police raid. Um, in 1907, there was talk of armed resistance. In 1895, there was armed resistance. So there's a whole pedigree of, of that practice in that particular area. And why do you think that is? Where did it come from? Um, partly because some areas in New Zealand have remained less influenced by um, the spread of European culture than others. And so they've kept traditional cultures intact. They've felt very protective about the areas. And um, a lot of people don't see any other alternative. It's unfortunate, but they don't see that there's any other area to get redress apart from this sort of activity. Was violence a feature of the treaty, say part of its formation? Um, no, there's no violence whatsoever, in fact quite the opposite. When the treaty was signed, one of the things that Governor Hobson was instructed to do was to get what they called free and intelligent consent. That is, the chiefs had to sign it freely without any coercion and they had to sign it intelligently. They had to understand what they were signing. So definitely not, there was very strong emphasis on a, on a, on a peaceful process and a legitimate process. Is this discontent something that stems from the treaty, say from its signing? Um, possibly. One of the, the difficult areas is that there, there are some Māori today who descend from chiefs who didn't sign the treaty. And their argument is, well, look, we didn't sign the treaty, therefore we're not bound by any sort of other sovereignty apart from our own. So we're going, there's nothing in international law that says we can't proclaim our own sovereignty. That's what they say. And possibly they're right. Um, there are good arguments on both sides. And so it's a very tricky area. And what makes it more tricky is that none of it's been tested. So we don't know if that's actually the case or not because it hasn't gone through a process to test it, test the argument. Do you have any idea what proportion of chiefs didn't actually sign the Treaty of Waitangi? Well, 542 chiefs approximately signed the treaty. A couple of them signed more than once. Um, we don't know exactly how many chiefs didn't because we, we can only estimate it. It might be perhaps 100, 200, 400, it's uncertain. Um, but probably, a rough, rough calculation, more than half the chiefs that could have signed it did sign it. So a significant amount did ignore it? That's right, some refused. Um, some two tour chiefs refused because they didn't like the idea of Britain having a queen. They said if Britain had a king, we'd be happy with that. We don't like the idea of a woman being in charge. Some of the Waikato chiefs refused because they said we signed the Declaration of Independence five years earlier. We, we don't see any need to, to sign another agreement. Um, and some chiefs, some two chiefs, for example, missed out altogether. Um, they weren't approached. So there's a whole lot of reasons why people didn't sign. You mentioned that the Tuhoi tribe were missed out. Was that intentional? Oh, it was just um, bad planning on behalf of the governor. The, the governor had five officials when he came here, and clearly not enough to, to have this massive treaty signing process undertaken. So he relied mainly on missionaries. Missionaries had the, the best knowledge of the country, they had the best language skills and so on. Um, but there was no coordinated plan. It was just a case of go out there, get signatures. And if, you can imagine in the South Island, there are about 10 or 12 Maori communities in the entire South Island. Now, if you set foot on the South Island with no roads, no maps, and try to find these communities, you can spend years doing it, just walking around. So it's an extraordinarily difficult task, and inevitably some trees will get missed out. So that's a part of the struggle? Uh, for some people. Some people are saying, because our ancestors didn't sign the treaty, we don't, we don't have to be bound by it. Our traditional ways should, should be what we live under, and, and that should govern us. We, we shouldn't be bound by anyone else. And there is an argument to make for that. If you don't sign an agreement, there's no way you can necessarily be held to be bound by it. So they make a good point in one sense, but on the other hand, um, the way that gov successive governments and the tribunal have looked at it is that the Treaty of Waitangi now covers all Maori, irrespective of whether or not their ancestors signed it. So under the Treaty of Waitangi Act 1975, if you're classified as Maori, then you're entitled to make a claim. So they've sort of, if you like, smudged over those little differences. How serious do you really think the situation is? It's hard to say. It depends on whose angle you're looking at it from. It seems that the police spent at least a year collecting intelligence on it, so they're clearly on top of the problem. Um, but it's always unfortunate when, 
when things resort to violence, it makes you wonder, uh, are all the other, other avenues really exhausted? And I think it's serious that people think that they have to resort to violence to get get some of the, some attention to the, the grievances heard. And why do you think that is? Has our democratic institution failed them in some way? Um, possibly. I think there's, there's an element of frustration. The, the average settlement value is roughly half of 1% of what the claimants are entitled to. So to put that in real terms, if, if you have a car that's worth $10,000 and it's stolen, and the insurance company pays out $50, you'd feel aggrieved by it. Um, if the insurance company then got you to say this is a full and final settlement, you're extinguished your right to have a claim again, you feel worse off for it. So it's partly that, partly that there, there isn't, um, they feel land's been taken, they're not getting back what they're entitled to. Um, could be other, other things as well, economic pressures, um, that almost feeling culturally they're under siege, that there's all these, these forces sort of washing away at the edges and eroding their culture and they, they want to do something to protect it. And so it's, it's perhaps out of frustration, but I really couldn't speculate on the reason that, that people would go to that length. It, it's surprising. The Tuhoi tribe featured prominently in articles about the, the recent arrests. Is this something the tribe as a whole would have known about or supported at all? Um, well, I don't think, firstly, we can sort of talk about the whole tribe, the several thousand members of it, um, partly because a lot of them dispersed like a lot of other tribes around the country. I think very few people know about it. There's, there's always rumours circulating, um, but very few people, I think, would have known about this. So it, it seems like it's just a, a very small group of people and perhaps not connected with some of the leadership um, they acting independently who are doing this. Articles also mentioned that it was mostly Māori involved. Is this a Māori issue? It's rather like saying that um, is, is the American invasion of Iraq a European issue or a white issue? Um, yeah, I think every ethnic group is, has its plurality and every ethnic group has a, a complete spectrum of opinions. And so it's very difficult to say this is particularly a Māori issue or a Tuhoi issue. It's, I think it's largely an individual issue or a very small cluster of individuals. Uh, nothing more. And lastly, Paul, how do you think New Zealanders should react to this? Well, th there's, there's nothing New Zealanders practically can do to react, apart from sort of perhaps feel outrage or, or concern about it, but um, certainly people arrested, they'll go through the court system and um, the court will decide what happens to them then. Um, but I think people can perhaps be relieved that something's been done now rather than it being left and goodness knows what might have happened later.